Hey folks, this is Todd Coburn. This is a supplementary lecture on Lecture 3. This is a live Zoom lecture that I perform for a set of students. And you can watch this as an alternate to the other posted Lecture 3 video. It's the same material, just presented differently, live to a Zoom audience. Enjoy. Just to kind of set the stage, the groundwork. Let's take a look at a sample that's failed in fatigue. This looks like a shaft. And actually, this is a failed shaft. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see inside. And if we look at this, we're going to notice some things, OK? And these things are going to teach us about fatigue, a little bit about fatigue. We're going to learn that fatigue can be broken up into three stages, stage one, stage two, stage three. Stage one is that initiation of the problem. Stage two is the slow growth of the problem. And stage three is the fast fracture that happens when we've lost too much of the section. You guys with me? If we look at this sample, we say, well, where did this damage start? And actually, with le less experience, it's hard to tell. But actually, notice these beach marks. See these little things? What happens is with fatigue, we have a place where the problem starts and then it propagates and it propagates slowly. And since it's propagating slowly, it leaves indication of what's happening. If you look at A here, that's actually where the problem started. The defect started in this part. Maybe there was a defect. Maybe somebody scratched the thing. Maybe it got dinged during manufacture. Or maybe it got to a stress level that went up a little bit into the yield and caused some permanent set that then started to propagate. We wouldn't necessarily be able to spot it by just looking at this, except that actually you'll notice here that it looks like you see all these little marks. How many of you guys have ever been to the beach with your mommy and you play in the sand and then the water comes up and it leaves these little ripples, these little beach marks? You see that? You'll notice these are all pointing to here. It looks like they're emanating from here. You see that? That says, oh, look, that's where the problem started. There was some kind of defect up in here. Then you'll notice over here, you'll notice, look, this failure, this looks like, so if you ever watch a movie where they're like, what we were just watching, we were watching Marvel, and uh, one of the guys rips off, Maybe it was Iron Man ripped off the arm of Bucky. My daughter's confused. She thinks Loki is a good guy, and she thinks Bucky is a good guy because they're long-haired, good-looking dudes, right? They rip off the arm. You see all the stuff hanging out? That's what that looks like. Somebody ripped the arm off. You see that? That is the fact. So what happens is we have a defect, and the defect causes a problem or a crack to grow into the structure. And as that crack grows, it's going to leave beach marks on the part. When the thing is growing really slow and each cycle hardly moves it at all, it'll look really, really polished and perfect. But as it grows larger and larger, each cycle will make it grow faster, which eventually will become more and more pronounced beach marks. Until, let's just imagine this thing's under axial load. If it was under axial load, if we loaded it to ultimate, we would see this whole surface would look like this. Right? But if we're in fatigue and most of this structure is gone and this is all that's left, you'll notice if the stress was P over this area initially, now the P over A is over a much smaller area. You see that? So what this says is, what happens is we lost more and more of the material until finally the loading of the part just exceeded the FTU. And then it rips apart, fast fracture, catastrophic failure, people screaming and dying, cussing you out on the way to their deaths. So if we look at this structure, do you think this was a high load or a low load that caused this fatigue problem? A low load? Why do you say that, John? Because uh, you have a lot of breach marks, and if it was a high load, it might have failed sooner. Exactly. There are two things you can look for. A lot of beach marks means it was probably low load. And secondly, 
a small failure area, right? It only needed a part of the, of the thing left to withstand the loading, the four fast fractions. You can put a point on your homework, three. Got it? Okay, so we see stage one is that initiation. Stage two is this beach mark growth and stage three is fast fracture. You got that? Okay, another comment. So this, you can see that actually what we're talking about is a crack growing through the part, but that's not how we analyze it, okay? When we deal with fatigue, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and test a perfect sample. We're gonna look at how it behaves. We're gonna convert our stress and sample to match that. And we're gonna basically look at, hey, we have all this test data for these parts that define the fatigue strength. And we're gonna convert our case to evaluate how they failed in the past. Even though we know there's a crack growing, we're just looking at in the past this lasted this long, so we should last this long. In the past, we landed for this last for this long, so we should last, last that long. You got it? That's, and I'm going to cover this on the next slide. That's the method that we're going to learn first, and we call that fatigue. The other method, which is we're going to call damage tolerance, is when we actually evaluate how big that crack is. Either we guess and assume a size, or we find it and say it's this size we measured it. And then we will evaluate how that crack grows under each load. Two different approaches. The FA used to require fatigue until the top ripped off that Hawaiian aircraft in the early 70s. They realized that wasn't cutting it. They came up with fracture mechanics, which they say is better. It's actually a little more hocus pocus, but actually... That's now what's required for evaluating. And I'm going to teach you guys the basics of how to do both. So you are armed with basic methods for both. Now, if you get in a company, you'll probably have, they'll probably have their own methods that they may change how you're doing it. But these methods will give you the ability to estimate and use in your analysis. Okay. All right. So that's where we're headed. And that's kind of a preview of what we're going to be doing. So uh, we're gonna look at three methods for evaluating fatigue, bang, bang, bang. The first one is called the stress life method. What this means is we are going to plot the stress level and we're gonna actually use a capital S for that because that's what they do against the number of cycles. And we're gonna evaluate how things fail. So that we can say, oh, we need this many cycles. Well, that, that's the strength we have. Or we have this stress level, and that's the number of cycles we're good for. That is the fatigue approach. And since we're using stresses against life, it's called the stress life method. And we're going to use the SN curve or the stress number of cycle curve to do that. That's what we're starting our journey on today. The second method is called the strain life method. And this is similar, but instead it looks at the strains and how those grow. That is thought to be a little bit more accurate, but because it's a little more complicated also, it's usually done in more research work or folks that are developing methods rather than the day-to-day -day analysis approaches. And the third method is called the linear elastic fracture mechanics method which although it is a type of fatigue analysis, usually we call that damage tolerance or fracture mechanics rather than fatigue. But it's basically a different way of valuing the same thing. You got it? Okay. All right. So uh, <clears throat> back, uh, this groundwork for this was laid by a guy named Moore. I think it was around the early 1900s. And basically what he did is he took a perfect pristine sample. So imagine we have a round sample. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna test it for repeated load. Now we could pull on it, but it's hard to grab and it's hard to make sure it fails we want. What he used is a bending sample. So imagine this rod and we're gonna bend it like this. I'm gonna switch to a flat piece, but it actually was a circular piece. See that? Now we have tension up here and compression down here. Now things in fatigue, that basically tension is what causes fatigue. If we, if we have a stress that's tensile, we tend to have fatigue issues. 
If we have no tension, we don't tend to have fatigue problems. However, if we go from tension to compression, that can be a problem. So, so the higher the stress, the bigger the problem, and the bigger the range between the stress, the bigger the problem. So if we go from tension to compression, that tends to be worse than just tension to zero. Okay, you with me? So if we went like tension, now up here it's in tension, and then went like this, now it's in compression, tension, compression. This would be one way of fully reverse bending. But actually, we can do it even more smoothly and simply if instead we took our sample and we bent it like this, but instead of reversing the bending like this, all we do, we're bending it like that, but now we rotate it. That means this point here is in tension. And as we rotate the sample, now this point is in tension. Now this point, is, you see that? So that means if we follow this point around, we're going from tension to zero to compression to zero to tension and so on in a nice smooth way. Like this, but it's actually a, you see that? See how that works? That's what we're going to call fully reversed bending. Now, if you think back to three, two, six, one, remember, when we grab a hold of this, we're going to have issues, right? Anytime we grab it or have a change in geometry, we're going to tend to get stress risers. And we, we want our data to be valid without any factors. So what they do is first they polish this mother like crazy, and then they machine it so we have a tight little place so we can say, oh, this should always fail right here. The stresses are going to be highest here. And then we polish this like crazy so that there are no surface effects or anything else affecting it. So that the stress level we get out of this fully reverse bending is, is as representative of the material as possible. You guys got that? That means if we test a steel sample, that's good for all steel samples made about exact, that exact material. If we test a different steel sample, that would be data that would apply to all samples like that, any aluminum sample and so on, okay? What this allows us to do is use this data beyond. However, how many parts are actually in fully reverse bending? Only a few. So later, remember I told you we have four lectures. Later we'll learn, so right now, today's lecture, we're gonna, we're gonna pretend that all stress levels are that perfect, pristine, fully reverse bending case. And we're going to call it F rev for fully reverse stress level. You got that? That's that perfect, pristine sample. How many perfect, pristine samples that are in that kind of fully reverse bending are there on aircraft? Not very many. First of all, there are only a few parts that have that kind of fully reverse bending. Secondly, there are no parts that are that perfectly polished. So what we're going to do after we lay the groundwork of our method today, we're then going to look at one part of fatigue and learn to do that better. Then we'll learn to convert any stress level. And, and, and next lecture, when we do that other part better, that will allow us to convert any old sample. If I have any kind of test sample and I know what the condition is, I can convert it so that it represents so that I can use that perfect data and apply it to my defective sample. Right? Got that? The second piece is we're going to learn to take different load cases and convert them to a fully reverse loading. And then the last case, because right now we're pretending that all stress levels are the same each time, we'll learn what if we have different stresses? How do we combine those? and compare it to the data. That's going to be our fatigue approach. You with me? Have I put anybody to sleep yet? Okay. Excellent. Okay, so uh and what we're the way we're gonna do this then with that said is we're gonna <coughs> plot. So we're gonna do testing, right? And let me get a clean slide here. What we're going to do is we're going to plot then the stress level against the number of cycles to failure. This is the stress level, right? We're going to give this a special name. So we've learned that we can use this and this to represent stress and this to represent allowable stress. But when we deal with fatigue, they commonly use a capital S. 
for the fatigue strain. So that's what we're going to use, S. And we could call it S sub F to draw attention to the fact that this is an allowable stress for fatigue. Got it? Okay. Now, if we took, now remember we're dealing with, with these, we got these perfect polished pristine samples under fully reverse bending, which means they're rotating as they're bending so that each point has a nice sinusoidal load going from tension to compression, tension to compression like this. Now, if we take that sample and let's say we take the first sample and we load it up to FTU, how many cycles do you think that's going to be good for? Like one. One, like one. One cycle. So we would expect this to be at FTU, right? For one cycle, which we could write that. If we want to get fancy, we could say that's 10 to the zero. It's 10 with zero zeros, which is one, right? Okay. Now, now if we go to like uh, something close to FTU, then we would expect some, maybe get a few cycles out of for failure, right? And if we go a little higher stress, we'd expect maybe, uh, I mean, a little lower stress, we'd expect to get a few more cycles, true? Now, if we did this for steels, let's take we take let's say we take one steel sample, and and we make like five hundred of identical samples. So we test them with a really high stress, and a little less 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 stress, a little less stress, and a little stress, and less stress. Right. Now, if we did this on a stress life curve, we would get something look like this, and we say, oh crap, that's really hard to curve it. We can kind of see what's going on here, but we can't see what's going on here. How, and so we go, that's not good. It'd be nice if we had straight lines. If we had straight lines, we can predict it better. And then they look at, well, let's plot this on semi-log paper. Yeah, that helps a little bit. Well, let's plot this on log log paper. And then we get log log paper, we get a curve like this, and they look at this, oh, wow, this is great. Look, we can draw a line through these points and draw a line through these points and draw a line through. It looks like we have three straight lines from here to here or from here to here, we have one straight line. From this stress level to this stress level, we have another straight line. And below this stress level, we have another straight line. You see that? Woohoo! We can predict in this range. All we have to do is make sure this is curve number one, this is curve number two, this is curve number three. All we need to do is make sure that we use this curve for any stresses occurring in here. This curve for any stresses in here, and this curve for any stress in here. You got that? That is our approach for fatigue. And this is how they develop the data that's going to be used for fatigue. So then we say, oh, wow, cool. If we start looking at this, now let's say this is all for steel. Let's just focus on steel for a minute. If we plotted this out for steel, no matter what steel we choose, we're going to find that actually this inflection point, we already said that this inflection point was a one cycle, right? We'll find out that this first inflection point is at about 10 to the third, which is actually 1,000 in disguise, right? And we'll find that this other point is at 10 to the sixth, which is at 1 million in disguise. No matter what steel we have, it roughly follows this curve. Woo! That's good. It's repeatable. That means we can just test a couple samples and actually extrapolate that data to cover a whole range of steels. Isn't that amazing? Okay, we're going to call this, now you'll notice what this means is if we're below this stress level, we basically get like 10 to the 6 or more life or maybe even so much life that they just stop testing because they get tired of testing it, right? How many of you guys ever had a dream where you're like fighting a giant? And like the giant's so scary, you hit him and you hit him and you hit him. And after a while, you're so tired because the giant is not falling down. And you're like, oh, crap, can I just go back to sleep? You ever had that happen, that helpless dream thing, right? Eventually, you just stop testing. Well, that's basically what this is. Basically, it goes so many times, people say, oh, forget it. I'm going to die before the still. We're going to call that infinite life. So if you're below this stress level, or even at this stress level, basically we're going to say this part of the curve is infinite life. All of this is finite life. This is mortality. This is immortality. 
This is Tolkien's elves, and this is everybody else. Right? Okay. We're going to call this part of the call curve low cycle fatigue, and we're going to call this part of the curve high cycle fatigue, and both of these together make up our finite life phase. So, basically, if we have a stress level below here, do we expect that to ever fail? No. So we're going to go ahead and call this the endurance limit. We're going to call it S sub E. Okay? That's the endurance limit. If we have a stress level that's above that, we can expect it to fail at some point. If we have a stress level that's below that, we will expect it to still be cycling 5 million years in the future while we're in heaven praising God. Okay, infinite life, finite life. Okay, if we have a stress level that falls in here somewhere, we can predict the life, the strength, the life of the thing, the number of cycles to failure for that stress. We would say, oh, this is the fatigue stress at, let's say this 200, at 200,000 cycles, right? This is the fatigue strength at say 3,000 cycles. This is the fatigue strength at 200 cycles. This is the fatigue strength at 200,000 cycles or 400,000 cycles. The, what is the fatigue strength at a million cycles? That's the B. Got it? Okay, so that is our approach. And once we have curve fit our material, we can now use these three curves to predict life from the stress level and stress level from the life. Remember, these fatigue strengths all correspond with fully reversed stresses, which means we reverse the stress from positive and negative stress, right? If we have a sample, we loaded in tension, 1,000, 0, 1,000, 0. Is that a fully reversed stress? No. A fully reverse stress means we go from bending tension to bending compression in a smooth manner from one stress level to the negative of the same stress level and back and forth. Okay? Okay. So this is what we're going to be doing. You'll notice we already know about this inflection point, right? That's FTU. We need to learn about this point and this point. That's what we're going to be focused on today. Got it? And we covered all this. So, what does this first term mean? Endurance limit. Endurance limit, below which we live at last forever. In fact, at which we last forever. What does this mean? Caden, you can uh, put a point on your homework three, by the way. Fatigue stress at any points. Fatigue strength, right? And that means, and what we really should say here is, at some number of cycles, right? At some end. Because really the fatigue strength for a low stress is different than a fatigue strength for a higher stress, right? For this number of cycles, I have this fatigue strength. For this number of cycles, I have a different fatigue strength. True that? But if I want infinite life, then that's S sub B. You got it? Okay. Those terms you need to understand at this point. Now we're ready to move on to that. Okay. All right. Now, that was all for steel. If we do the same thing for aluminum, we would also get a curve that looks like, kind of like this, with these inflection points. You'll notice here where this is 1, 10 to the 0, this is 10 to the 3rd, this is 10 to the 6th. You'll notice here what we're seeing is this is 10 to the 3rd. So actually, this is looking from here. And this is 10 to, eight, to about here. You see that? So this curve corresponds with that part of the curve. And this is for aluminums. And you'll notice for different aluminums, we get different curves. What you'll notice first is this first inflection point. The highest strength aluminum is about 82 KSI FTU, right? If this is 80 KSI, what that suggests is maybe aluminum doesn't lose anything in this low cycle fatigue range. That's what it suggests to me. However, we're going to assume it follows the same shape. The next thing you'll notice, where with steels, this inflection point here was at 10 to the 6th cycles, which is here. You'll notice the inflection point for aluminums appears to be 
out in here somewhere. So it looks like the transition from finite to infinite light is at a higher number of cycles for lunar. You see that? However, we're going to use the same exact format of curve for our class for luminum, which means we're going to assume this first inflection point occurs at 10 to the third, and we're going to occur, assume this second inflection point occurs at 10 to the sixth. And we're going to assume that this follows the same shape with three curves. Okay. What this says is aluminum is similar, but not quite is precisely following that style of failure. Okay, you with me? Next idea. Okay, now we're gonna do another plot. Let's just say, okay, now we're dealing with steels again. Okay, you still with me thinking about steels? And uh, let's say we say, okay, let's take a bunch of, let's make a 400 steel site samples, but let's make them out of different steels. Do you know that steel strength can vary from about 40 KSI for the crappy stuff that the civils use? They use stuff from 40 to 60 KSI. And the, like a common steel for like fasteners will be somewhere in here with a common value about 180 KSI. A lot of the aerospace steels will follow between about 100 and about 200 KSI. And if you get a really high strength steel, you might get up to even like a, a 300 KSI or more. Okay. So actually, depending on what alloying elements and how much carbon and how you process the thing and heat treat it and cold work it, that can give you a wide range of strength. Steel is pretty amazing stuff. Okay. So let's say we make different samples out of different steel alloys. So some of them have high strengths and some of them have low strengths. Now you can say, oh, wait a minute, this is like, the differences between people of a certain nationality, right? Even though we might classify them all as behaving the same, they really have a wide range of behaviors. And steels are people too. However, if you pay attention, you recognize regardless of what's politically correct, certain ethnicities tend to be good at certain things and less at other things. And different ones have different things that more of their people you will find are good at something or maybe bad at something. Have you ever noticed that? I don't think it's politically correct to talk about this, but hey, let's focus on reality here. And even though the steels might be offended if we talk about it this way, steels tend to yield pretty well and have a pretty high strength. Now, this little steel right here might be offended if we say this. Nah, I only have a 20 KSI. Okay, so you're a 20 KSI steel. I'm digressing. What I want you to recognize is we have steels that are completely different that still behave kind of like steels. And if we take a bunch of samples from amongst that people group, we're going to get some different behaviors. What we really want to do is classify all of the group if we can, if it is repeatable and realistic because that will make it easier to predict, oh, I've got three students that are of this, three students are of that, three students are of that, and that's gonna make our team the best, right? So we took all these samples and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna test them to find the endurance limit, are you with me? We're gonna test all these different steels within the steel band of ethnicity to find out where they have an endurance limit. And so down here, we're going to plot the FTU of the steel. And here we're going to plot the endurance limit of the steel. Are you guys with me? Did I lose anybody? If I if you started to drift because you didn't like my analogy, come back. It's, this is important. Okay. If we have a steel with a FTU of 60 KSI, what is our endurance limit according to this curve? 30. About 30 KSI, 30. right? And you'll notice there's some scatter here, right? They don't follow exactly, but it looks like if we have a 60 KSI steel, it looks like the different samples are mostly going to get about 30 KSI endurance limit. 
What if we have 100 KSI steel? All those samples. 50, about 50. 50. If we have, say, 160, what? Where do those fail? At 80. At 200, where do they fail? At 100. 100. Oh, my gosh. Are you saying that if we take the FTU and we multiply it by 0.5, we actually can represent any steel. Look, is this steel the same as that steel? No, they're from the same country, but they're diferente. But they both follow roughly the same relationship. We can classify all steels, whether they're crappy, weak steels, or great, strong steels, to the same relationship. You guys got it? Is that cool? However, you'll notice once we get up here, and you'll notice there's scatter, sure. You'll notice the scatter is increasing as we increase the, the strength, right? Scatter's increasing. And you'll notice here, once we get to somewhere out in here, you'll notice the fewer of the points are along this line and more of them are below the line. In fact, it looks like they're kind of lingering down in here once we get beyond a certain strength level. You see that? So when we use this data well, what we do is we say, okay, we can use this simple approximate the endurance limit is 50% of F, and this SUT is just Shigley's way of saying FTU. So that's just FTU, okay? 50% of FTU. However, we're never going to go above 100 KSI. So basically we can say, hey, what's our FTU? Multiply it by 50% and just never go above 100 KSI. And that will represent any steel. Any material that's from the steel country is going to behave like that. You guys with me? Is anybody offended and needs a point? Okay. You got that? Okay. This is pretty amazing. Have you seen endurance limit anywhere in your handbook up to this point? No. Where are we going to get it? We need a whole nother set of data. But do you see any material data with FTU? Woo, this is like taking any batch of students, you just throw them down on the bench, you find out what they can bench, and if they're a student, then their bench falls into this category 50% up to about 100 KSI. Is that cool? Pretty cool. Okay. You'll notice another thing. We're calling this S sub E prime. S sub E prime. Oops. We're calling this S sub B e prime. Okay, S sub B, e, that's the endurance on it, remember? S sub B e prime, we're gonna add this prime to mean the perfect pristine endurance. Remember that perfect polished sample? That's the endurance limit for that perfect polished sample. How many perfect polished samples do we have? Zero, right? Next lecture, when we deal with endurance limit, we'll, we'll actually always start with the pristine, perfect endurance limit, S sub E prime. And then I'm going to teach you how to convert that to a more realistic S sub B for any real part. That's a function of whether we're not polished. What's the surface like? How big is the sample? What's the actual loading on the part? Because this endurance limit is for fully reverse bending on a perfect sample, right? And yet we may have a sample that has a different kind of loading, different size, different kind of everything. And therefore we're gonna convert that. We're gonna do that starting with next lecture. That means this lecture, you still with me? All the time we talk about endurance limit for this lecture, we're talking about that perfect pristine endurance limit for a fully reverse bending. After next lecture, I'm gonna expect you to be able to take the S of B prime and convert it to a real S of B for your part. Got it? And this relationship is for what? Steel only. Yes. Point. Right? You with me? Okay. We will look briefly at what that relationship is for other materials shortly. Okay? All right. Now we're ready. Now you guys have basically learned conceptually most everything we need for this lecture.
but you haven't learned to do much. We're about to change that. So this slide has the meat and potatoes of how you do it, right? How you do it, okay. We're going back to that S N curve and we're looking at it. And the first thing we say is, okay, the fatigue strength, what do you expect is our fatigue strength at one cycle? F to you. And remember when we say that, one cycle really means positive to negative, but really that's really good for a half a cycle, right? So basically if we can get to F to you and survive, we ought to be able to get to the negative of that and not fail until after we get to the negative, right? So let's just say, okay, that's taking, extrapolating a little bit. Let's say that's good. So our first inflection point at one cycle is F to you. Got it? Okay, next inflection point. This next point here. So we know what this other one is, but this one here, what we could do is we want to find out where this is. Now, if we focus again on steels, uh, we would have to plot the SN curve for a bunch of steels to find out what this value is. However, if we did that, we might find a relationship. And, and what we want to do is use something that's easy to remember that we already have the data to convert it. So what we're going to do in true engineering fashion is we're going to use, we're going to introduce a new factor. We're going to say, if you take, remember, we already know FTU. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a factor and we're going to call it F. This is the low cycle fatigue strength factor, okay? You notice this up. Now remember, we use up for stress. And now you're finding that we're also using up for this low cycle fatigue strength factor. The reason we're doing this is because that was what Shigley does. I still haven't changed. I should change that to a different number because this is really confusing. Is that a stress? No, that's a factor. You got it? Okay. With that said, what we're going to do is say, okay, Let's just say that this point here, we could call it S inflection point, SI or something. That is at F times F T U. Okay? All we need is this fraction and multiply by F T U. So if you look at steels, we find that actually that that fraction F is a function of our F T U. So if we have a high strength steel, we're gonna get a value that's like 0.77. If we get a low strength steel, we're gonna get something that's like 0 0.9. And in between, we're gonna get something off this curve. So we could just take our FTU and read the curve. You got it? What material is this curve good for? Steel. Okay, now if, if we actually, now we, actually could do this, but if we read this curve, you know the problem? I could give you a problem and for a certain FTU, five students will get five different numbers. And that's irritating. However, this here, this, I curve fit the curve. Actually in your handbook, it traded out this SUT, which means FTU with an F. That's just FTU, right? I made that a little clearer. So if you take FTU, and plug it into this equation, that will tell you precisely what that factor is. You see that? So we're not gonna use this curve. We're gonna use this equation. Do you know why? Because if five students use this curve, I'm gonna get five different numbers. But if five students use this equation, I'm only gonna get three different numbers. <laughs> but you should all nail it, right? If we were using a slide rule, you guys would have a reason to complain. But actually, with your calculators, you can program this in, just plug in F to you, and bang, you got that fraction. Got it? Okay. This keeps it simple. Remember, we used F to you to approximate S of E prime. Now we're finding we can use F to you to approximate that F, that S inflection point. That gives us two of the inflection points we need. We're only going to need one other. We already found out this one, right? Actually, all of these are a function of FTU. This is one times FTU. 
This is F times FTU. This is 0.5 or something times FTU with a cutoff. Whoa, is that easy or what? FTU properly used gives us the whole fatigue enchilada. And who doesn't love enchiladas? Got it? Okay. Some of you look bored. What's this curve good for? Uh, just steel. steel, right? Yes. What if we have an aluminum? Yeah. What are we going to use for F? 0.9. Yeah, baby. Who said that? Me. Point, Mr. Orr. What if we have a titanium? Also 0.9. 0.9. Yeah, baby. What if we have cobernium? 0.9. What if we have Joel Vargasinium? 0.9. 0.9. Okay, do you know what the most common mistake students make for this portion of this class is? They use this equation when we have a non-steel, and they use this factor when we have steel. Can the factor be 0.9 for steel? Yes. Yes, as Buzz Lightyear's yet... Lightyear says, can. However, will it happen? Probably not. Because it could be anything. Got it? Okay. So now we realize, oh my gosh, we've got our three inflection points. This is FTU, this is FFTU, and this is 0.5 FTU for steels. We're going to find out it's a different factor for some other material, but we'll look at that in a second. Now that we have those inflection points, we actually can apply a little bit of mathematics to a log-log curve to get the equation at the slope of the, we're gonna need the intercept and the slope of this curve and the intercept and the slope of this curve. And then we just need to know the flat line value of this curve and we can do all fatigue analysis. Remember though, here's the caveats. This is for a fully reversed stress later and that's all we can deal with now today's lecture all we're all the homework today is all fully reverse stress however later we'll learn how to convert other stresses to a fully reverse stress today we're using sb prime later we'll learn how to convert other other things from sb prime to what the real endurance limit is but we're going to use ftu 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 for these three inflection points. And now we can do our fatigue analysis. You with me? Okay. So we have our first point at FTU at one cycle. Our second point is at FFTU at a thousand cycles. Our third point is at S sub B at a million cycles. So what is the equation of a straight line on log log paper? Well, if you think back to your prior mathematics, you'll find out that this is the equation of the of a log log line. It's we can get the ordinate or the vertical axis with this equation and the horizontal axis with this. That means we plug in the number of cycles we want to be good for and with the coefficients, and that will tell us what the endurance strength is at that number of cycles. Or we can plug in the fully reverse stress that we need to be good for, and with those coefficients, we can calculate the number of cycles that we're good for. So we can take a number of cycles we need to get the endurance strength at that end, or we can take the, the stress level that we find and find the allowable for that number of cycles. You see that? Is that awesome? Now, before, everything was compared to FTU, but now we're finding our strength, our fatigue strength 
S sub F is a function of how many cycles we want to be good for. If we want to be good for a million cycles, what fatigue strength are we good for? S sub E, right? If we only want to be good for one cycle, what fatigue strength can we go to? FTU. Okay. That's our approach. So now you'll notice this equation is valid for this curve and for this curve. Okay. However, the coefficients are going to be different. So. Let's focus first on this curve and find out what are the coefficients. What's the intercept of that curve right there? It occurs in FTU. FTU. What's the slope? Well, if we plug in the two endpoints, we would find that the slope is this. What is that right there? That is not the stress. That is the stress fraction, the low cycle fatigue strength fraction. You see that? Let me warn you guys. The next most common mistake that students make is they plug in a stress level for this because it looks like the stress, but it ain't, okay? This here, that's our fully reverse stress. This here, that's our stress fraction. These are the coefficients, and for low cycle fatigue, it's this, okay? Now, for high cycle fatigue, we will use the exact same equations, however, our coefficients are going to be different. Because if you follow this curve up, you'll notice the intercept is up here. So there's our intercept, and there's our slope. This is our stress fraction F, F to U, and S of B. E. This is F to U, S of E, and our strength fraction again. See those two Fs are our strength fraction. Got it? Okay. Another common mistake is F to U, S to B are both in KSI units in this equation. They're both got to be in KSI units in this equation. Okay. All right. All right. So actually, all we need to do is figure out. So uh, the next common student mistake, you'll notice, what is this? If we fail in this level, what is that called? Low cycle fatigue. Yes. If we fail here, what's that called? High cycle High fatigue. fatigue. And what's this called? Infinite life. And what is all of this called? Finite life. Yeah, baby. Got it? So was that John Ragsack and I think one other were the leaders? You guys can each claim a point. Okay. So that means, let's say we have a part that uh, has a fully reverse stress. Let's say that, uh, let's say that FTU, let's say this is steel, this is 100 KSI. And let's say that F is 0 0.9. And let's say that S sub E is uh, 30 KSI. All right. Let's say we have a full reverse stress of 5 KSI. What is this good for? How much, what's our fatigue strength? Uh, could you repeat that one more time, Professor? If our if we have a steel with an FTU of 100 KSI, an F of 0.9, and an S of B of 30 KSI, and we have a fully reverse stress applied to this part of 5 KSI, how, what is our fatigue strength? It's infinite. Well, actually, our, our fully reverse S is just, actually, we should say this. We're good for, maybe I worded that poorly. We're good for infinite cycles. 
That's our fatigue allowable number of cycles, right? Infinite. What if we have a fully reverse stress of 20 KSI? What's our allowable number of cycles? Still infinite. Still infinite. Still infinite. Still infinite. What if we have 30 KSI fully reverse stress? Still infinite. Still infinite. What if we have 35 KSI fully reverse stress? Still. Is that still high still. cycle or low cycle fatigue? It's high cycle fatigue. It's high cycle fatigue. We read the curve, bang. Right? What if we have 50 KSI? Is that high or low cycle? It's high high cycle. Now, here's where you guys are starting to get a little choked up. What should you do is say, okay, what is our F inflection? It's 0.9 times F to U. That means it's at 90 KSI. Is this above 90 KSI? No. No. Therefore, it's high cycle. What if we have 60 KSI, high or low cycle? High cycle. What if we have 80 KSI? High cycle. What about 89 KSI? High cycle. Still high. What if we have 92 KSI? Low. Low cycle. You got Low. it? So we compare our stress level first to S sub E. If it's less than or equal to S sub E, it's infinite light. If it's more than S sub B, e, but less than FF to U, it's high cycle fatigue. And if it's more than FF to U, it's low cycle fatigue. The reason we have to do that, common student mistake is they attribute damage to infinite light. The next one is, they use the wrong coefficients. They use low cycle for high cycle and high cycle for low cycle. Okay? So once we've evaluated which one it is, that helps us to select which set of coefficients we plug into our equation to estimate life from stress and vice versa. You got that? Okay. If we have a part that has, uh, let's say we have a part that has an allowable number of cycles of 10 million, is that high cycle, low cycle, or infinite light? Infinite? Okay. Infinite. 10 million, anything over 1 million we're assuming is infinite, right? What if we have an allowable number of cycles? of 200,000 cycles. High cycle. What if we have, true. What if we have an allowable number of cycles of 400 cycles? Oh, so no cycle. Low cycle. Right, okay, you with me? What if we have a stress level of, uh, well, we already dealt with stress level thing. What if we have a part that's subjected to 50 cycles? Is that high, low, it, infinite life or something else? Probably don't know yet. Why? Because it hasn't broken. Or broke yeah, baby. Yet. Okay. Two points. A common student mistake is I'll give them a part. I'll say this has 200 cycles. And they said, ooh, that must be low cycle D because it falls in strength. But I didn't say that's the allowable. I just said that's what experience is. We would have to calculate what the stress allowable is for that and find out where it falls within that F, F to U, that F, F to U, and that in order to classify it. You see that? So the number of cycles that we have is different than the allowable. And the stress level that we have is different than the allowable. But we will use the, uh, well, we need to select the correct range. Okay, great, excellent work. All right. Here's our basic approach. These two equations, do these work for high cycle fatigue, low cycle fatigue, or infinite life? Of all of them? Almost. Or sorry, uh, not infinite life. Yeah, yeah baby. The first two. Point. These equations work for both high cycle and low cycle fatigue, not infinite life. We actually could do this for infinite life, and I just give you a new set of coefficients. Maybe I should do that. If not, Maybe for about a year, maybe I should give you another set of coefficients to make it even easier. However, now that we use these equations, what is the thing we have to watch out for? The uh, coefficients. 
the coefficients, high or low cycle. If we have low cycle, we're going to use these coefficients. If we have high cycle, we're going to use those coefficients. What is the F in these equations? Fatigue stress factor. That factor, right. The low cycle fatigue strength factor. Good. And uh, strength fraction. And then we've got, what kind of units do we have to plug in these in? KSI. KSI. Great. Infinite life is this. Great. We're going to need to start with FTU. We then use, okay. Now here's another thing. We learned about FTU and we found out that, uh, excuse me, we learned about steels and we found that steels have this relationship, right? Now I'm telling you, these are the S of E primes that we're going to use for other materials. Now this lecture is lecture three. Next time we're going to cover endurance limit, but there's one thing you need from that chapter of your text and that's this table. Because for this homework, you need to be able to grab any of the appropriate materials. What is the relationship between S sub E prime and, uh, and uh, FTU for iron? It's 0.4. And what's the cutoff? 24 KSI. How about for aluminum? 0.4. And what's the cutoff? 19, 19 KSI. KSI. You know what the commonest student mistake is here? They go uh, going max above SC. the max. Yeah, I give them an aluminum. They use a, an S of E prime of like 32 KSI. And I, whoosh, right? 19 KSI is the max for aluminum, we're assuming. How about for titanium? What's the cutoff? No cutoff. We're not using a cutoff. Exactly, Mr. Ragsack. You can uh, claim the point. Okay, you guys got all that? All right. So we're going to get FTU. We're going to estimate this. Are we going to use this as our endurance limit? Yes, this lecture. After this lecture, we'll be using, we'll be converting this to S of E, right? Now, after this, we may still get an S of E that's equal to this. Like if we have a perfect pristine sample in full reverse bending, we'll still get S of E prime. However, we're going to do something to it to find out if it's still that or something different. And usually it'll be something different. You got it? But for this homework, we're assuming S of E prime is S of E because we don't know any different yet. But you need to be able to use this equation or this 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 uh, to evaluate S and E prime for any of the materials. So these are our equations. These are our coefficients. We're going to use F to U to estimate F. We're also going to use it to get S of E prime, and then we're going to use these to go from a fully reverse stress level to a from a fully reverse stress level to an allowable or from a number of cycles that we need to endure. Which of these two isn't allowable? N. Actually, either one of these can be considered allowable, right? If we have a fully reverse stress level, then N is the allowable number of cycles. But if we're given a number of cycles we need to be good for, then this is the allowable stress level that we can repeat and, and meet that requirement. You see that? Like for, uh, I've been working on uh, on a BR uh, on a, a BRJ nine hundred lately, doing a lot of fatigue analysis, and their design objective for the aircraft is eighty thousand cycles. Anytime I estimate a life that's more than eighty thousand cycles, there are no new inspections needed. If I estimate less, I have to impose inspections. Boeing's aircraft, their seven three seven, a hundred thousand cycles is designed for. McDonnell Douglas, we used to design. Certain planes for 30,000, other planes for 60,000. A lot of these aircraft have been climb numbers. So what that means is if we plug in a stress level and get more than that design service objective, then that would be, a, we could write a margin of safety on that. You guys got that idea? And you also need to be able to get F. Where do we get F? From that equation. What do we use that equation for? For little f? Only for steel, right? Otherwise, it's going to be 0.9. Okay. Here's a little example. We actually have a little part. This is a 1050 steel. And we want to first find out what the endurance limit is. So if we want to do that, we go and we take this material. We find our FTU and we multiply it by 0.5. Is that, is that need to be cut off or is that acceptable? It's acceptable. That's acceptable. 
Our next thing is we're going to go to our equation. And for the FTU we have, we're going to get a F. And then we're going to take F and multiply it by FTU because that's going to tell us that other inflection point. This is one inflection point, And this is another inflection point. True. And FTU is our, we got FTU, we got S sub B, and we got FFTU. Those are our three inflection points. We're now ready to do the thing, right? If we have, this is our fully reverse stress, is that gonna be low cycle, high cycle, or infinite life for this material here? Low cycle. High cycle. High cycle, because this is less than that. Agree. Therefore, we get the coefficients for high cycle of the cube, and we can estimate our life. Like blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? Is this an allowable? Not really. That's the stress that we have. Is this an allowable? Yes. It's actually the allowable for this stress level. Or you could say, well, if we needed this, this is the allowable for that number of cycles. You see how that works? Let's erase this. I had to give the other class two points. So let's try. What this is doing is this look is looking at more samples like we saw in the first slide where we're seeing different kinds of loading and whether we have, you'll notice everything over here is if we have a high stress, over here is a low stress. You'll notice the difference is we have high stress, we have a large fracture surface, less beach marks. If we have a low stress, a smaller fracture surface, more beach marks, right? And if you study this out, you can kind of get a feel for recognizing different kinds of fatigue failures, both for high and low stress, and for when you have different kinds of stress concentration factors, okay? Uh, professor, yes, um, I'm having a tough time visualizing what exactly those pictures are. Like, are those just cross sections of those parts? Yes. So what okay. this is is let's just take a shaft that has a loading. We cut it in. Let's say it fails. So we look at the failure surface. If it looks like this, that means we probably had a high stress with no stress risers on the part. If that those beach marks are less clean, see how they're kind of smooth and they're less smooth for these two parts? It means there probably was a stress concentration factor affecting that. Okay. A similar curve, but with more beach marks means you probably had a lower stress level on that. If you have a rectangular section, then those samples look like, you're not gonna have to do much with this other than be able to recognize, does this look like it filled under a high stress or a low stress? Can you do that? Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. That's all we're going to do with these. Here's a few more. This is under bending. You'll notice it looks a little different. But once again, high stress will have a large failure surface, and low stress will have a low, smaller failure surface. This is the same kind of curve for high and low torsional stresses, how those might look. This is looking at a sample. And here we can't really see where the problem was. It looks like the beach marks here are pointing this way, but until you realize, wait a minute, what happened is the failure started up here. We can tell by this. See this here? This is, oh, that's where it actually fractured fast. What this is, is these are beach marks that happened so slow. See how polished that looks? This thing progressed so slowly at first that it ends up looking really polished. And only after the, the, uh, a lot of the material had been removed, that crack started growing faster, and that's when we saw the beach marks, which went until it actually fast fractured. Was this looks like this field at a high stress or low stress? Really low stress. A yes. really low stress point because the tiny fracture area. Here's another sample. Here we can see that actually here, the beach marks are over here. It looks like we have some kind of defect here. And you'll notice, once again, they're, they're noticeable here, but notice how they get more noticeable. Do you think this was a high stress or a low stress? High stress. High stress, because see how big the fracture surface is? Most of the part. Got it? Here's a couple. Uh, oh, this is a weird one, because you'll notice the fracture surface is out here. That almost never happens. 
But it looks like, like what happened is they had a little defect in the middle of the part, maybe when it got manufactured. You'll notice the growth was really slow and eventually it fell. Was this a high stress or a low stress? Low? Maybe kind of medium. Look how most, uh, a little more than half of it's gone or something, about medium stress. This wasn't bending, was it? This was probably, if you look at those other things, it looks like a torsional failure to me. If you look at some of those other samples, failure might have been a, a torsional. Yeah, I was going to say it didn't look the same as the other ones we'd seen. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. This it says it was loaded axially. So the way this weird surface is basically because this defect caused it to come apart here. Here he is. Okay. Here's a question for us. Oops. Oops. What is a fully reversed stress? Uh, C. Is there the bottom one? I don't know. Hey, very good. How about what's the max fully reversed stress this can withstand? Uh, that's S of E, isn't it? If a steel part has that, what would the, you estimate as the endurance limit for the part? 60? 60 KSI. Okay. Yeah, baby. Very good. How many full reverse cycles can this withstand? Thank you. Man. What is the endurance limit for aluminum? True that? Yeah. Okay. That's all I got for you. Questions?